Well, welcome everyone to today's Monash Partners Comprehensive Cancer Consortium Precision Oncology Seminar. My name's actually Melissa Southey. I'm the research director of the MPCCC. I'm standing in for Mark Shackleton, who was unable to join us at short notice today. He's actually the clinical lead of the Precision Oncology Program um, and director of, the, of oncology at Alfred Health. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the people of the Kulin Nations, who are the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered today at MPCCC and across Victoria. I respectfully acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging, and pay my respects to any members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders community gathered among us today. The MPCCC Precision Oncology Program undertakes to build capacity for next generation sequencing in southeastern Victoria and to build capacities for the application of personalised cancer medicine within the MPCCC partnerships. In doing so, our program is providing potential treatments across particular treatment options to patients with rare and advanced stage cancers who are on their last line of therapy. Precision Oncology Seminars are a key educational activity of our program and we're delighted to be joined today by Nick Waddle to share some of her valuable experiences and insights with us. Before I hand over to Nick, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping um, aspects of the program today. Um, could all attendees please ensure that you have your video turned off and your microphone muted before we begin. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of Nick's presentation. Um, to ask questions, please click on participants at the bottom of your screen and select raise my hand. Alternatively, please raise your hand physically with your video on and I can see you um, and invite you to ask your question. After Nick's answered your question, please click lower hand and put yourself back on mute. So without further ado, allow me to introduce you to Nick Weddle, Head of Medical Genomics Group um, at the QIMI Burkhofer Medical Research Institute. Nick is a cancer researcher and collaborative bioinformatician who's an expert in the interpretation of next generation sequence data. Her research group focuses on the identification of mutational processes and therapeutic opportunities in cancer. Today, Nick will outline some of the major historical and current achievements in cancer genomics. She'll then describe some of her recent work using whole genome and RNA sequencing to study cancer genomes. This will include recent work in a variety of cancers, including melanoma, with a focus on precision medicine. She'll also talk briefly about some of the work she is part of with the Queensland Genomics Community Group. So thank you very much, Nick, for joining us today. I'll hand over um, to you now to, to commence your slides and your presentation. Thank you very much, Meeve, and thank you to um, Mark, who unfortunately isn't here today, but also to Melissa for the, the kind introduction. Um, really happy to be here, um, particularly in the, in the interesting times that we're in, and um, just uh, thoughts and wishes go out to everybody who's in Victoria, Melbourne at the moment. Um, it's uh, new times that we live in. So I will just share my screen and hope that everybody can see that okay. Um, good, okay, yeah, so, so basically today I will be talking a little bit about um, some things in cancer genomics. Um, I've got two parts to the talk. One is more of a very somatic cancer genomics and the other is going to be a germline cancer genomics type talk. And, be and before I start, um, there's, I've got some acknowledgements at the end, but I will be thanking people throughout the whole talk because there's really a lot of people involved in all of these sorts of genomic studies, as I'm sure everybody's aware. And so it's important that we acknowledge them as, we, as I go along. <clears throat> Here's a quick disclosure. So I am a co-founder of um, a spin-out company from QMR Burghofer, my institute. So that's just a disclosure at the beginning. And then, yeah, so this is the presentation outline. So as I mentioned, um, I'll start, um, first of all, looking at somatic cancer. I'm gonna look what's happened recently in big cancer sort of somatic profiling studies. And then I'll touch base on the Australian Melanoma Genome Project. That's a project that I've been involved with for the last three or four years now. And we're really starting to put some good publications out in that sort of space. And with that project, we've had a focus on melanoma immunotherapy outcome prediction. And so I'll touch on a cohort of patients that have received immunotherapy in that time and underwent genome and RNA sequencing. And some of the findings that we had in that and trying to predict who may or may not respond to immunotherapy. And then after that, I move on to a change shift quite a bit and go into germline cancer. Um, that's um, where I started my, my early postdocs was in the germline cancer space on somatic analysis. So I'm going to talk about a project which is the Inherited Cancer Connect project. 
which is actually our Australian Genomics flagship project and kind of give you a nut date on where that project is and how it's going because we're, we're actually at the end of that project now. Patients have finished recruitment and we're in the sequencing analysis phase. So I'll, I'll briefly talk about that too. So cancer genomics, I think um, everyone is, is aware of what it is and what it's doing, but I, I do like this slide. This is an old review now. It was in 2013, um, written by Mike Stratton. And he talked about how cancers develop at a mutation molecular sort of level. And so essentially, um, when we're all born, we have um, lots of cells in our body. We've got um, chromosomes, a bit from mum and a bit from dad. And as we're going through our life, we end up, our cells end up coming against intrinsic mutational processes. Um, and also some of these can be environmental, they could be lifestyle exposures, such as UV light, um, cigarette smoking, that sort of thing. And over time, our cells are continually getting mutated, but undergoing repair. At certain points in our life, um, obviously the cells don't, can't repair all of this damage. And so we get this sort of benign tumor or mutative phenotype occurring. And then over time, we, these cells can acquire more mutation, um, turn into a cancer cell um, with oncogenic ability, and then can change during the life of that tumor um, under treatment selection pressure or under moving around the body and that sort of thing. So this is a sort of cancer genomics journey of, of cells. And when we're doing cancer genomics, we're really only taking one point in time and we're sequencing a part of a tumor, which is very dynamic over time and can change, but we're sequencing one point in time. Um, over the years, I'm sure everyone's aware, um, there's been two major initiatives doing cancer genomic profiling, um, the TCGA in the US and the International Cancer Genome Consortium or ICGC. And this is a map um, that was towards the end of those initiatives. And it's really just trying to highlight that um, within each different countries, and there are many countries involved in these cancer genome projects, there were lots of cancers that were sequenced. Um, some exome sequenced, some whole genome sequenced, um, some with RNA sequence and some with methylation sequence. And this has generated a massive data resource, which is very, very commonly used today. And I think it's really driven our knowledge of cancer on in the last 10 years or so. Um, recently, um, uh, well, uh, early this year, there was a whole suite of papers that came out from the Pan Cancer Analysis Whole Genome Consortium, somewhere known as PCOG. Um, and there was um, a whole group that came out in Nature, and since then there's been papers that are continually becoming out in this space. And what these papers are, these were a result of putting together over two and a half thousand whole genomes from a variety of different cancers, and then trying to analyze those genomes and see what might come up and what new insights can be gained. I've put this graph here, all the data is available. You can go onto the Peacock website and start searching for genes, mutations, and that sort of thing. Um, those samples and black boxes here, that was actually Australia's contribution to this project. And I, th I think that's really great because Australia, um, we're involved in three projects, pancreas, ovarian, and skin, so skin melanoma, and contributed a lot of data into Peacock. And I think that's a really good, really good result for Australia and a really good, good result for all the people involved. So this would be um, Sean Grimmond and Andrew Biankin. Over here we had David Botel and the, the Skin Project. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in detail, mention the people involved there. But you can see in PCOG, it's an enormous amount of data, 780 terabytes um, from over 2,500 patients, lots of files, lots of information, and lots and lots of things happening in that space. In particular, um, the papers that are coming out of PCOG or have come out of PCOG already, they're focusing on things like driving mutations, tumor evolution, heterogeneity, looking at the structural variant landscape of cancers, trying to get a better handle on mutational signatures and many, many others, whether it's mitochondrial mutations, methylation changes and so on. It's, it's, if you haven't seen the papers, it's worth going and having a browse and having a look through because there's some really nice things in there. That's kind of like somatic cancer, so the Australian Melanoma Genome Project. Um, as I mentioned, I've been involved with this for a number of years now. Um, it's, uh, if you want more information, there's a website link up here. It's basically a collaboration between several entities. So clearly the Melanoma Institute of Australia um, with Graham Mann, Richard Scolia, James Walmont, and also Georgina Long, who's there as well. Um, and then folks at the University of Sydney, Prince Alfred Hospital, Westmead, there's, there, there's more, more than on this list. Um, I'm from Kiermaier Berghofer, and there we're working, um, the team of people that are really involved in the project there is Nick Haywood, um, Peter Johansson, Felicity and JP. Um, I'm, I'll be talking a lot about Felicity and Peter's work today. I'll be presenting some things and some things that were found from the Melanoma Genome Project. 
Um, I'm sure everybody knows melanoma. Melanoma is um, a common cancer in Australia and New Zealand. It really is sort of Australia's cancer in a way. Um, and it's a malignant tumor, a pigment producing melanocytes. Um, there's lots of immunotherapies that have been introduced and they're radically changing treatment outcomes for patients, which is fantastic. And the Australian Melanoma Genome Project, um, it's kind of set out to profile the whole genomes and where we can RNA and methylation sequencing have a huge number of um, melanoma samples. So currently, um, whole genome sequencing has been, been performed for about 600 patients, maybe 650-ish. Um, all that analysis is complete. We've got through everything and we're really just kind of putting the whole, whole cohort together now and, and looking at what melanoma is and, and trying to get a better handle on all those driver genes and mutational processes that have occurred. So I'm sure you know, this is, um, this is a plot from an old paper in 2013 where it just kind of shows the mutation burden of a variety of different cancer types. Melanoma is the top end. Um, it's got lots of mutations, mainly driven by UV, so the sun um, really battering the DNA and causing UV damage. And the issue with all of those mutations it actually makes it really hard to analyze because trying to find significantly mutated genes or driving events in tumors, you need to sequence a lot of patients to see any signal and to understand what might be going on in those cancers. Um, so that's why um, today we've sequenced 600. Um, as I say, we're writing all of these up at the moment. And a lot of the data I'll show you today is actually unpublished, um, maybe under review in certain cases, but most of it's unpublished. So the cohort that has been sequenced um, is comprised of different types of melanoma. So we've got cutaneous melanoma. So that's the very much the sun-exposed, UV-damaged um, melanoma on sun-exposed surfaces of your skin. We've got some acral melanomas, um, which are more in fingernails or palms of hands, soles of feet, that sort of thing. Uveal melanomas, which are in the eye, um, mucosal melanomas, which are more um, internal mucosa membranes um, that have occurred. So slightly different, rarer subtypes of the acrals, uveals and mucosals. Um, but the cutaneous is very common and over 300, and 300 patients have been sequenced as part of this study. What have we learned so far? So in the cutaneous melanoma, um, we published a paper in 2017, which um, published 130 of these cancer genomes at that point in time, that's what we had sequenced, and about 90 cutaneous melanomas. And we're able to show the cutaneous melanomas have a high tumor mutation burden, which is no surprise. We we're able to identify um, a lot of this high tumor mutation burden because of the UV signature. And if you look here, uh, we're able to tease apart um, the sun exposed UV signature into actually three different types of signatures. And these have been sort of um, written about more by others since, since, that, since the time that we published them. And so we're not really sure why there's three UV signatures. Some may be due to indirect sun exposure or direct sun exposure, but there appears to be three mutational signatures which are caused by UV damage. Um, but a uh, very high mutated tumor. Um, mucosal melanoma, so we had a paper out earlier this year which really went through a, a subset of the mucosal melanoma samples and we found that those tumours, unlike cutaneous, are very different, completely different genomically, very different. They have a low mutation burden, they have a huge number of structural rearrangements um, and this is just shown per sample the number of rearrangements that exist. And this is a circus plot, it's an example, around the outside we've got the chromosomes, all these lines on the inside is where there's a translocation that's occurred in one of these tumours. And you can see there's a whole genome duplication effect around the outside here and a huge number of rearrangements, very complex rearrangements, frequently involving driver genes like TERT um, um, or, or RAC1 and so on, but a huge number of events we think activating a lot of oncogenes that sit, sit below there. Interestingly, although they're mucosal, which are, they're, they're more on the mucosal lining, internal linings, you do get some UV signature present, particularly in some of those around the, the nose region and that sort of thing. So again, that could be just slight exposure to UV, um, either through the nose or reflection up into the region where the tumor is and so on. But there is definitely a slight UV signature in some of those tumors. The acral melanomas. So um, we have a paper that actually got accepted today in NatureCom, so that's, that was good news for the team. Um, acral melanomas, again, we were able to go through and find new driver genes in acral melanoma, particularly this TYRP1. If anybody works with that gene, love to, love to speak more because um, this gene actually has a hotspot mutation, but it's a frame shift mutation hotspot. If it's a hotspot, that would normally mean it's probably oncogenic, but because it's a frame shift, it's whacking that protein out. 
but it could be, we, we anticipate that maybe it's creating a shorter peptide, which is an activating mutation of that gene, which is driving, driving the cancers in this case. We're also able to go through for those acral melanomas and look at the site of the tumor. So whether they're on the palms of the hand, soles of the feet, under the fingernails, and again, look at the UV signature and see different levels of UV signature and different levels of mutations that exist at those different sites, which kind of makes sense. But it just kind of, it just shows and highlights um, how important sun exposure is in these tumors and how much UV damage is contributing. There was a really nice paper that came out um, quite a few years ago now from Peter Campbell, where he did sequencing of non-tumor um, skin cells in, in the eyelids of, patient, of, of, of um, participants and also found clonal mutations that existed in that non-tumor skin cells. So the amount of damage that's going on from the UV sunlight is, is, is quite, quite, quite amazing. That's kind of like a snapshot of the Australian Melanoma Genome Project and where it's up to and what's happening in that sort of space. But I'm, I focus now on a more of a, 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 a treatment sort of cohort. So this is a, a cohort of melanoma patients that underwent immunotherapy treatment. And obviously we're very important, we're very, very interested in that at a genomic level because um, the genomics of tumors and the RNA sequence of tumors can help us understand why some patients are responding to immunotherapy and some patients aren't responding to immunotherapy. So this picture here, um, it's probably, probably the version two, I think, of the cancer immunity cycle from these authors. Um, it's a nice figure, but um, it talks about the immunity cycle and about how neoantigens are generated and released from tumor cells that are dying. And then these can be captured by dendritic cells and then presented. And then on presentation, priming and activation of T cells, the T cells can then travel back to the sites of the tumor and then initiate an immune response and then killing the cancer cells. So this is where immunotherapy comes in. So checkpoint blockade inhibitors. So they've been designed to target these different parts of the immunity cycle to kickstart the immune system and be able to make it see cancer cells. In the context of immunotherapy, it's had a big impact on melanoma. I'm sure everyone's aware of that. Um, so this is um, uh, an older trial, so Checkmate 067 trial, where single treatment immunotherapy with IPI, um, this is the survival curves, um, Nevo is able to put their survival curves a bit higher and then immunotherapy in combination gave the best result overall. But the survival curves are really, really changing with, um, with immunotherapy the pro progression-free survival curves. There's a, an important catch. Um, it's, an, it's an expensive treatment. And so it's, it is important to try and find out why patients are responding or not responding and who may respond and who may develop resistance. One, for the benefit of patients, but also to feed back and then improve how these immunotherapies may be given or in what combinations they may be given best in the future. The cohort that we had, um, so again, this has come, this is in total collaboration with the Melanoma Institute Australia and Georgina Long is at the front here. So um, Georgina kind of led this whole collection and cohort um, and they were part of the Australian Melanoma Genome um, Project and got sequenced that way. So there's 77 cutaneous melanomas. The treatment that they received was either a PD-1 inhibitor alone, so there was 58, 53 patients who received that or a combination therapy with a PD-1 inhibitor and IPI. And the, co the patients were separated into those who responded well, those who didn't respond well. And some of the things that we had available, we had a whole genome sequence of the whole cohort. We had RNA-seq of as many as we can get good RNA for, methylation profiling, and then immunohistochemistry was done on PDL one and also on um, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes that were there. And we did a whole bunch of different analyses. Um, all of this work at the moment is, is not published yet. It's under review with Nature Medicine, um, but so it's, it's, um, it's, it's good to talk about it today. So basically this is um, the survival um, within the cohort. Um, so progression-free survival, it was significantly prolonged obviously in those who did well and those who did bad. Um, response to treatment, this is um, the blue line here is people that receive combination therapy um, the orange line here is those that received anti-PD-1. You can see that those on combination therapy tended to do better. Um, patient response was measured using the RESIST criteria. So about 59% of patients had a good response um, to immunotherapy and the remaining 41% had a, had a poor response. And what we're able to see um, when the, the cohort was split into this poor and good response is that good responders were, were generally um, older 
they were less likely to have acromucosa or melanoma or have a BRAF B600 mutation. Um, they're more likely to be treatment naive. They had a lower M stage um, and more likely to have received combination immunotherapy and also more likely to develop toxicity than the poor respondents, which is also, it's kind of been noted about that in the literature in the past. So we went through the genome data and we were trying to find um, sort of genome features that are associated with response and survival in these patients. Um, in, in this case, progression-free survival. And obviously tumor mutation burden has been kind of well documented. Um, melanomas have a huge mutation burden. So that means um, that's thought to be one of the reasons why they're responding to immunotherapy. Uh, this paper in 2018 is a pan sort of tumor analysis of people that have received immunotherapy looking at those that responded versus not responded. And found that mutation burden is significantly different between those that respond. In melanoma, it's been shown a few times that um, those that respond do tend to have a higher tumor mutation burden. That there is a bit, of, um, a bit of debate now in the literature. There's been a few reviews come out recently talking about the relevance of tumor mutation burden. I think particularly in framing it about what's an appropriate threshold, what's high in one tumor type, is that, is that suitable to be high in another tumor type? Um, and also an acknowledgement that the tumor mutation burden is measured, measured primarily from single nucleotide variants and, and sometimes indels, and that's not really, um, might not capture the whole of the potential for neoantigen presentations. It might not be the whole story, so it won't, won't always be completely predictive. What we found in, in this cohort was that um, um, those who responded did tend to have a higher um, tumor mutation burden. And when you separate the patients into those who had a high and those who had a low, you do see a survival difference. So in this cohort, it confirms that tumor mutation burden is a, was a good proxy, but is by no means the be-all and end-all for predicting response to treatment. Now, in terms of neoantigens, um, I kind of mentioned these briefly. So if you have mutations, um, the idea is that you can get a, a mutated protein that can be um, chopped up into peptides. These mutated peptides through, through TEP and MHC are then presented on the cell surface of tumor cells, and they can be recognized by the immune system and initiate an immune response. So we're able to do um, some bioinformatic approaches now where you can take all the mutations and predict of those mutations which ones are likely to undergo this and be presented to the cell surface. So basically, we found that um, in, the, in those that responded well, they had a higher number of neoantigens. Um, so again, that's nothing too new, but it's nice to see it in this cohort. And when we looked at neoantigens that were specifically expressed at the RNA level, um, we also get a good correlation between um, the poor and good with those that responded well, having more neoantigens that are expressed. And we then went on to look at structural variants um, in the cohort. So. Um, to see if they were associated with the response. And we found that there was a slight, a slight significant difference in structural variants whereby patients that actually did um, worse had a higher number of structural variants than patients that, that did better, who had a lower number. And you can see that's in a progression-free survival as well. You can see here, those with a high amount of structural variants tended to, to, to have a, a shorter progression-free survival time than others. Um, and it's interesting in the context of when you have a high tumor mutation burden, we didn't find any difference at all between whether you had a high number or low number of structural variants. But if the patients had a low mutation burden, suddenly the signal from the structural variants made a bigger impact. So if you were low tumor mutation burden and a very high number of structural variants, you tend to be in the, in the worst category of response to immunotherapy. So what about looking in the data for if there's any genes that are linked to, to response? Well, for melanoma, this is actually really, really hard. And so it's, it's kind of a cautionary tale because there's a lot of literature out there showing that the mutation of this gene is important in response because it's seen more in those that responded than not responded. So we found that when we did the analysis in this cohort, we just couldn't find anything that was significant. Um, and although if you look here for agrosis, there's gene names down the side here, and the patients across the top, those that did worse and those that did good, you can basically see, yes, there are lots of genes that have few mutations in the poor group and many in the good group. But the issue is because this good group have a high mutation burden, then most of the genes in these patients have a mutation. And so when you correct for mutation burden, we didn't find anything significant. There was no gene that stood out as having mutations other than not in, in the poor or the good group. 
said, um, there is some really nice literature out there now which looks at um, specific genes or pathways. And this is one, this is a lovely review that came out this year actually, it's worth a read if people haven't seen it, whereby they reviewed and looked at things that um, were involved in resistance to immune checkpoint blockade. And this is one of their figures, um, basically it's a nice figure because um, over the time there's been multiple sort of CRISPR based screens to try and look for critical tumor intrinsic um, interferon signaling roles. And there's a few genes, um, particularly those, the JAKs and the STATs, um, that have been shown to be implicated if you have mutations in those may be implicated in um, a different response to immunotherapy. And there's a little bit, um, a little bit of evidence around um, APLMR and the ARID and PBRM1 as well that have been linked to um, how a patient may or may not respond to immunotherapy. What was interesting in the cohort that we've got here is that um, there was um, only four patients who received combination therapy that, that were deemed to have a poor response based on the resist criteria. Um, one of these patients had a splice site mutation in JAK3, and we think, we think um, based on prediction that that splice site will knock out JAK, JAK3 or, or, or produce aberrant splicing. And it was also correlated with a sample that had very low expression of JAK3. Um, and it's been previously shown that JAK3 mutations in lung cancer are associated with increased pd one expression and response. Similarly, the other two cases in this group, um, they both had um, mutations or loss of function mutations in SDK11. One of them had a frame shift deletion, one of them had a structural variant which broke the gene and was loss of function. Both these samples also had very low expression of SDK11. And again, mutations in this gene have been implicated in immunotherapy resistance along and no carcinoma. So it was interesting to see, see these appearing in this group of samples. You'll see there's other mutations here. These are just missense mutations in orange, and we think that they're probably not playing a role. They might, may likely be passenger, passenger mutations. They weren't predicted to have a high functional consequence on, on these genes at all. So what about pdl one protein expression? Well, um, it's very well known in the literature that expression of pdl one um, can indicate who will respond to immunotherapy. And in fact, there's um, immunohistochemistry assays that are out there and been developed to, to do this exactly. And there's even FD, FDA approved examples in non-small cell lung cancer, um, where based on PDL staining patients may or may not receive first line or second line use of immunotherapy. <coughs> so in our cohort, I mentioned that everybody had PDL1 staining. You can see PDL1 staining is a very good, if you have no staining, you are you are um, those poor, so the patients that performed poorly were likely to have no staining, but the patients that performed well, it was kind of 50-50 whether they had a good or poor staining. So, or sorry, staining or no staining at all. So you can see it's not a great marker, but it is it, it is a marker and it does correlate with progression-free survival. We can look at the RNA seq and try and see how the RNA seq um, um, correlates back to the protein expression. So this here, these percentages here, the percentage based on IHC. Um, so increase in percentage along here, and you can see that the gene expression levels, you also see an increase in um, amount of gene expression, which, which is there, so they correlate really nicely. And again, when we look at the samples in terms of poor and good um, responding patients and progression-free survival, we see a, um, where you have higher pd one gene expression, you do better, and your progression-free survival is much better than those who have a low expression level. Other things that play a role, um, and this is where the RNA-seq really comes into its fore, is you can use RNA-seq to sort of deconvolute the tumor microenvironment and look at the cell types that exist in that environment and see if different proportions of cell types are correlated with the response or not. So it's well known that CDAT cells within the tumor microenvironment are a, 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 good, a good thing. And we were able to do um, sort of deconvolution using RNA-seq. Um, in this case, we're showing cybersort results. So this is the proportion of CD8 T cells within the microenvironment of those of these patients. Across here is an is a like um, uh, staining by immunohistochemistry looking for CD8 T cells as well. And you can see that using the deconvolution of RNA seq, we get a very good correlation again between what you see in immunohistochemistry. Um, we can do something similar with methylation profiling. We can use methylation to deconvolute. Um, the cells in the tumor microenvironment, and again, we get a, a, a good correlation between methylation, actually better than the RNA-seq, um, and immunohistochemistry. And clearly, when you look at methylation and RNA-seq, 
we get this beautiful correlation um, of cells that have been predicted in the microenvironment, and you can see there's some, some indication of um, an association with response based on the, the amount of CD8 T cells. Look at that a bit more. So here's the immunohistochemistry again. So in this case, the red is the low number of CD8 T cells, tended to be more, more the case in those that had um, a poor response based on resist, and those with um, a good response tended to have a high number of CD8 T cells. And this was confirmed in both the RNA-seq and the methylation as well. So that was nice to see. Um, there's also a bunch of different gene expression signatures that are out there. Um, there's the, the literature is actually full of them. And there's different, even, there's different um, gene expression scores that you can use to, to look at um, who may or may not respond to immunotherapy. Um, for Lissy in the lab, she tried a lot of these scores, spent a lot of time trying to get them all working and looking in the data set to see which ones recapitulated. Not all of them did, I have to say. Um, so that's one thing to bear in mind with, with what's out there in the literature. But the ones that did really nicely um, were these ones here, so interferon gamma 6, interferon gamma 18, T effectants, and a chemokine signature. These kind of went hand in hand. These are the genes that are involved in those signatures, and this is their expression, just showing they're more highly expressed in the good responders. And the interferon gamma 6 signature was particularly good and showed the most um, sort of correlation between those that had a poor or a good response and with progression-free survival. But you can see none of these things that we're looking at are perfect. Um, all of the things, whether it's tumor mutation burden, SVs, you always get a outlier patients that do the, re the reverse to what, what you're expecting to see. So um, we try to bring it all together. This is um, Peter Johansson's work. We try to bring it all together and try and do like a multivariate analysis. But we took into account things in the tumor, things in the tumor microenvironment, the actual phenotype of the patient, um, things that may be sitting around in the blood. And then we tried to, lots of different ways to try and find a multivariate prediction response to see which are the key things that are, that are driving the response to treatment. The two that in our data set that were very important and the, the combination of those two gave us the best um, prediction was actually tumor mutation bur burden and the interferon gamma signatures. Um, and you can see here, they're able to predict um, progression-free survival um, very well in this data set. And we, we kind of put it together in this sort of way. So here we've got tumor mutation burden on the Y, got interferon gamma six on, on the X axis here. And what we're trying to show is um, patients that, that had a good response, uh, sort of shown in green here, patients had a poor, poor, um, the poor response is shown in orange here. And then we had some outlier patients. So these are patients that were either predicted good, but had a poor outcome, or they were predicted poor, but they actually had a good outcome. And then so we went through and systematically tried to figure out why that may be the case. So we've clearly got this group that have um, a high TMB and a high interferon gamma 6. They always seem to do very well. We've got this group that have low and low and they seem to do bad apart from these ones that had a good outcome. Of the ones that did have a good outcome down here, they all went on and acquired a resistance quite quickly. <coughs> and so we think that potentially um, for a longer term survival, they don't actually have a good outcome. This one up here is our JAK3 splice site mutations. They were predicted good based on the TMB, um, but obviously they ended up with a poor outcome. And we think that is because of the JAK3 splice potentially playing a role. Um, these samples here are all desmoplastic. So again, that could be a reason why these three um, samples were predicted good, but they actually did bad. And then these samples down here, they were, actually, they were cases that received PD-1 monotherapy. And we know that in combination, um, we get better results. So maybe that could be a reason why they didn't quite do as good as we'd anticipate. And they're also on the lower end, I guess, of the tumor mutation burden as well. So for the summary of that sort of part of the talk, um, I hope you can see that genomics and transcriptomics are really important into given mechanisms of response into immunotherapy. And you can see that response is associated with a whole lot of things, high TMB, low SV number, interferon gamma signatures, pd one expression, cells within the tumor microenvironment, and so on. And it's only by pulling all of this stuff together that we actually can get the best predictive power of who may or may not respond to treatment, and also find mechanisms of who and why people are resistant to treatment. Cool. So then I'm going to switch tack a little bit for the last, for the last little bit. I'm going to move away from somatic cancer and talk more about germline cancer. And um, this is all about an Australian genomics flagship project. It's the Inherited Cancer Project. So here we're not sequencing tumors. We're sequencing blood samples from patients who, are, who have um, an inherited um, cancer phenotype. 
And then what we're doing in this project is we're trying to evaluate the usefulness and safety and also the cost efficiency of whether routine whole genome germline sequencing could be useful in clinical practice um, to target otherwise unexplained familial cancers. So um, acknowledgements on this slide are basically the AGA, AGHA flagship um, folk. So Uwe Dressel, he's up here in Brisbane. He's the project coordinator for this project. Um, the project leads are <coughs> Robin Ward, Jenny Mitchell, Paul James and Mandy Spurdle. Um, and then Amy Davidson is a PhD project in the lab and she's really been the one who's done um, all of the analysis, the whole genome sequencing data, and then doing all of the reporting and so on and looking at the data curation. So what, so what is the study um, and how has it been set up? Uh, basically, participant recruitment in an ideal study to demonstrate the use or not use of whole genome sequencing in this context, you need to recruit hundreds, thousands of patients from family cancer centres across Australia and then do a comparison of standard of care where you do single genome panels and you compare it to doing whole genome sequencing and then have a, a, a comparison then to see how things went. <clears throat> Obviously that's very very um, unlikely to happen, there's limited funding and so the aim of the project was actually do, to do 190 cases um, using whole genome sequencing and sequence 190 individuals from cancer families. At the beginning of the project the expected pickup rate, so the rate of diagnosis to try and find underlying germline events was between 5 to 20 percent and this is for picking up things that are in previously unsolved cases. So how do we try and ensure that we try and get 5 to 20 percent diagnostic rate? Well in the study there was a pretty strict participant recruitment criteria put on. So basically for patients to be involved in the study they had to have have had prior clinical genetic testing, which has all been uninformative. So they're really at the end of the line now and clinicians aren't sure what to do so they can come onto the study and get whole genome sequencing. And they needed to have at least one of the following. So the family had to meet a criteria for her uh, hereditary cancer syndrome, so multiple cases within a family. Um, we did have um, colorectal and polyposis folk, people and families that were included and they had to meet two or, or more criteria. So there were either early onset age, um, an individual having two primary cancers or greater than two primary cancers, or um, more than one first degree relative with the same cancer, or greater than two first or second degree relatives with a cancer, which could be any type of cancer. And the, and the hope there is that we only select participants with a very high chance of getting a genetic diagnosis through this approach. And so we ended up doing whole genome sequencing. So all 190 patients have been recruited. We actually recruited 196 in the end, <clears throat> and they've, they're all undergoing whole genome sequencing, and we've analyzed about two thirds, the remaining which are undergoing sequencing at the moment. So about 130 cases I'll show you today. So this is the study design. Um, recruitment was from a variety of cancer, family cancer clinics around the country, um, and participants were enrolled um, their standard care plan of pre whole genome sequencing was recorded, so we got information about what prior testing they had. Um, there was a DNA sample provided. Whole genome sequencing uh, um, was undertaken, um, and, then, and then the data came to us. We did all the sequence alignment and variant identification, and all variant curation was done using ACMG guidelines. And for this project, we're reporting on a gene panel of 101 genes, which had been picked um, by the clinicians involved in this study and kind of hang as a hand curated list of um, cancer genes that, that, that are, uh, are likely to be involved and have some sort of um, clinical change of practice at the end. So we generated a preliminary research report that was discussed in MDT um, with both scientists and treating clinicians and um, the project coordinator and genetic pathologists. And then post MDT, um, um, a report was, was generated and there was a revised care plan established and or and validation of the variants that were reported. So at the end of the studies so and early next year, hopefully um, we'll be able to extract the costs of performing this sort of approach and then compare that and then look to see if it's um, viable at a sort of a cost level and then provide recommendations to MSAC about this approach. So the study population that we sequenced, um, this is basically showing um, the number of diagnoses per person that were sequenced in the family, so per proband. And you can see many cases only had one tumour, but a lot of cases had multiple tumours. 
um, some with two, three, four, or even five tumors in a small number of cases. Um, the types of cancers they had varied massively. So this is the, just the list of sort of cancers that we, we collected. You can see there's other, um, there was lots of interesting cancers, lots of very rare cancers and a, a whole suite of things. Um, and this is the age of the participants. So you can see um, under 10 years is here. And then um, we go around and we've got 11 to 20 years, um, 21 to 30. So there's lots of young people in this cohort um, with some older participants here from 60 and upwards here, but generally a younger cohort than you'd normally, normally see. So I thought I'd show you just a few cases and then I'll show you one slide to kind of summarize up what we found and where we're up to now. And, um, and I think that'll be it for today. So this is one case. So this is um, a male. Um, so they, they've been diagnosed in the past with four primary leiomyosarcomas um, on back, leg and chest. Um, they did have previous T53 testing, but that was all uninformative. So they came on, they had the whole genome sequencing done. And then what was found was um, a novel pathogenic stop variant in FH. Um, this was confirmed clinically by, by, the, by the treating clinician teams that was confirmed. Um, and FH is associated with hereditary lyom, lyomatosis, so it kind of um, makes a little bit of sense, and also with renal um, cell cancer. We did also find an uncertain missense variant in POP1, um, which is interesting. So whether that is also contributing or not, it's not really clear because it was, came out as an unclassified variant. Um, we did work with um, Hilda Pickett and Nick Hayward, and they kind of did a telomere length assay to show that the variant is probably doing something to telomere length, but, but how this is associated with the disease is really, really not known at this stage, um, particularly in light that the FH um, pathogenic mutation is there as well, which is probably very much associated with this disease. So there, there were some changes to risk management for this patient based on that FH um, mutation. Um, so they now undergo regular skin surveillance for lifetime, um, annual abdominal MRI for lifetime, and there's family risk management, which is now available as well. So that was a, a case where there was change in management for this patient. It's another example where there was a positive result um, back. This is a female, um, a 13 year old, who was diagnosed with thyroid follicular cancer. Um, and then a few other things later on in life, a few years later. They'd had P10 and molecular karyotyping and everything was fine, nothing came out of that. And the whole genome sequencing found a pathogenic stop gain variant in DISA. And so this has also been clinically confirmed. And then so for that patient, the changes that are now um, available is there's now um, DICE-1 testing available, um, annual thyroid checks, um, chest CTs and so on. And um, in some instances, um, um, some extra screening for, for renal conditions as well. So there were, there were additional cases that were, where we found um, so, uh, that probably the causal variant that was um, after the MDT was deemed to be the causal variant. Two of those were in genes where um, we weren't previously tested as part of their patient's routine workup, but after the whole genome test and the survey of the 101 gene panel that we did, it was deemed that they, yes, they were probably the, the variants that were driving disease. Um, there are also highly suspect variants found in regions that would not typically be covered by routine clinical testing. So examples of this was two variants in the APC um, 1B promoter region. Um, one was a single nucleotide change, another was a complete deletion. These are currently being confirmed to see if they are um, liked with causal variants. And there was also a deep intronic that was found in the BEP1 gene of a, a big cancer family actually, and it's predicted to alter splicing. Um, so that's, and BEP1 would really fit phenotype for this family. And so that's going undergoing clinical confirmation and some RNA studies as well. So these are interesting found. And then um, as, as a side note too, there was one patient where we actually found a RUNX1 fusion gene. And um, that was, we were sequencing the blood, the germline um, blood samples. Um, and then later on it was confirmed the RUNX1 fusion was actually um, residual tumor cells from a blood cancer. And so that's kind of a, an interesting mm -hmm. highlight of a secondary um, finding that was found in that person. This is a sum, some of the studies. So, so far, um, as I say, we're about two thirds through. Um, so results have been returned for two thirds of patients. Of those, um, there was no variant reported for 55%. 45% did have at least one variant reported. 10% um, are deemed to be causative. So pathogenic or likely pathogenic. Others 
we're uncertain in prediction, um, may be associated with the phenotype, and uh, there's a whole load, 57%, that are not associated with phenotype. So you can see that there is um, a bit of a dilemma in some of these things when you're reporting back on things which are a little bit more broader than one or two genes and all of these variants of unknown certain significance. Um, but that's where the study is to date. So about 10% about, about and so it's 5% overall here and the new results looking for, I think we're about 10% diagnostic yield so far after the study. But that's it. So it's just left me, I mentioned that there's going to be a few acknowledgements. So this is the acknowledgements for the germline cancer work. So the, the Australian genomic study, um, I've already mentioned the team up here. Um, and this is the QMR team, in particular Amy Davidson, who's really done all of the whole genome sequence analysis. Um, and these are all the funding partners that have been involved in that study. These are all the acknowledgements for the melanoma work. A lot of people, because um, there's obviously a lot of samples that have been collected over time. Um, a special thanks have to go to the Melanoma Institute Australia, in particular Georgina Long, Richard Scolia, James and Helen, um, Inesh and Alec, Alex Menzies were, and Matthew were really important in the on-treatment cohort. And Graham Mann, um, who wasn't in Sydney anymore, but Graham's been obviously very instrumental in the Australian Melanoma Genome Project. And then in Brisbane, we've got um, John and Nick Hayward's group, um, my group, and um, Anne-Marie, who have all contributed to this melanoma study. And so that's been really good. And of course, all the patients and families, because without them, um, we couldn't really do the sort of work that we're doing. So I hope that was useful and two different sort of stories. And um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Nick. That was amazing. <laughs> um, and congratulations on another significant publication. It's always nice to give a talk the day you get the acceptance email. <laughs> That's right. It was pretty good. <laughs> um, so I'm just being a bit slow to read. Can you see the questions coming up, Nick? Or? Oh, I can see the comments. I don't mind fielding the comments. That's all right. And I think if people want to ask other questions, they can raise their hand as well. Yeah, I haven't seen any hands yet, but there's a comment there, if, which everyone should be able to see. Yep, there's a comment there. So, um, analyzing the entire genome could be quite daunting, especially when you intend not to miss any mutation. So, what tools do you employ in analyzing these sequences? Yeah, so um, trying not to miss mutations is very important, but the looser you do your calling, so the more mutations you try and call, the more chance it is of um, calling false positives too. So, there's always a, this trade off between sensitivity and accuracy to try and tune the best approach. So the approaches that we use to call mutations, we always use two calling strategies. Um, so for our simulated type variants, we use an in-house tool called QSNP, we use GATK. For structural rearrangements, we may use QSV or DALI, um, copy number, ASCAP. There's a whole lot of tools out there. They're, they're all really good. They're all very well written in the literature. So you pick a tool, read about it, benchmark it. And as I say, we always run two at least, and then we, we look at the mutations called by both of those tools um, and that enriches and gives us a better accuracy. And if you know you've got a certain cancer with a certain driver genes, like you know there should be a BRAF V600 mutation in a big number of your tumours, then we'll look at lower confidence or try and rescue mutations so that we, we try not to miss the particular action mutations. But it's, um, yeah, for, for, for me, I think, I think the processes for doing whole genome sequence analysis are getting more more easier and I think they're getting more sort of standardized a little bit and more accessible to people. Oh actually Lavinia has come up with what I was wanting to ask you. You did bring up methylation profiling yep. in one of your early slides and I think you stuck it into about two after that but you didn't give us much information about what technology and perhaps I'm no, I didn't. interested in knowing if you're thinking about bringing it, in, bringing it into your multivariate analysis as well. Yeah, no, both good, yeah, good questions, good points, Melissa and Lavinia. So, so basically the methylation technology used for that was the EPIC array. Um, it was the 850 EPIC array, um, which is good. Um, so we, we didn't actually put the methylation data in the paper that's under review at the moment, but we've gone back and had a look at it in a bit more detail, and there certainly is very good signatures and things coming out of the methylation data. So I think if it came into the multivariate analysis, it would be very interesting to see how that, how that did. We haven't actually done that yet, but I'd expect it to do a little bit better there. Um, methylation now, we've been using the Oxford Nanopore long read sequencing technology to do whole genomes. That's expensive, um, but we love the methylation calling from that because you get really good correlation back to the Illumina EPIC arrays and you get methylation across the genome and you can do different things there. You can improve the deconvolution of the 
cells in the microenvironment, that sort of stuff. Um, so it's, that's, that's a good approach. Uh, uh, I think methylation is probably understudied in the context of immunotherapy response and or just the feeling that, that, that I think is there. Um, and there's a question about how was the somatic variant in blood confirmed um, and what was the reference to compare? So that variant was confirmed, um, I think it was, I'm not actually sure, but it was, it was confirmed in the clinic lab. Um, they went away and did, did the, the assay to confirm it. Um, but I think it was maybe even been through ish, but they confirmed that the RUNX1 was there. It's, the, it's a, the very common one that you see in some blood cancers. Um, so that was picked up. And uh, the missense POT1 variant, why do you think this is important or a driver? Um, we're not really sure if it is important, but it's just, it's just interesting that um, the POT1 variant, some variants, and Nick Hayward's put a paper out recently looking at um, these sort of variants in the germline of some cancers. But if you have POT1 variants that are thought to be functional, you, you end up with um, a different telomere length than the general population of the, that is your age, matched aged. And when this missense variant, um, Hilda Pickett did the work for us, and she showed that this missense variant in particular um, resulted in a much higher, a much longer telomere than the than other members of the population at that age. And so we're kind of um, pretty sure that it's functional in that sort of aspect. Whether it's important in their cancer, we don't really know, unfortunately. Um, particularly with that FH mutation sitting there, that's obviously very important in that person's cancer. And then there's a question from Greg as well. So Greg's asked about, um, uh, just started to know about TCGN, looking to data mine. Um, we should probably have a talk offline, I reckon, Greg. <laughs> you should probably just send me an email and we can have a conversation. Um, but there's a lot of data out there. Um, TCGA is great. Um, there's good online portals to grab somatic mutations and calls. If you want to look at germline things or if you want to get the raw sequence data itself, it's a bit more problematic. You have to um, make sure you've got good ethics in place and apply for data access. Um, we tend to just grab TCGA data and reanalyze it. So it's on sort of the same sort of level playing field as the other data sets we're looking at. But, um, but I agree, Greg, it's a massive resource. It's sitting there. Um, I think that TCGA data set and ITGC data set have been used in publications, hundreds of publications all the time now. So I think it's, it's really, really good. Often the first resource you need to consider is your own institutional computational capacities. <laughs> yeah, that's true, actually. And, and trying to find good bioinformaticians in your yeah. <laughs> getting help. Um, that, that said, there are there are now data portals you can use and plug and play a little bit. But um, yeah, particularly if you're writing grants, I, I'd say to anybody writing grants who's got a gene, they're interested in a pathway, the, the data is sitting there and it's very plug and play. The portal is just to get some preliminary data and more evidence that things are important in cancer. Yeah, good point. And actually more and more available now. I, that was probably a historical comment, but old yeah, people are allowed to have them, I think. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, to, to Stephen Fox. Hey, Stephen, how are you going? Um, heterogeneity is frequently seen. Yes, heterogeneity. So heterogeneity is very bad in melanoma too because it's got such a high number of mutations that are there. Um, one, you've got high TMB for cutaneous. In the acroids mucosal, you've got all of those rear which are driving heterogeneity as well. Um, it's actually so bad in melanoma, I think it's, it's, we found it really hard to predict. Um, so Phyllis is looking at that at the moment, trying to get a better hands on heterogeneity, but it's, it's really, really hard to predict. In terms of looking at different areas from the same tumour or, or METs and primaries, there is a small cohort of the samples where we do have METs and primary sequenced. Um, I've probably had more experience in other tumour types, to be honest. So in esophageal cancer, um, with Andrew Barber up here, we've been sequencing different regions of tumours down the esophagus. So whether it's at the top, the middle or the bottom of a tumour, they will all have been sequencing tumours over time. And that's another tumour type which, depending on where we're sequencing, we get very different results for some patients. Um, some patients might have a very sort of stable genome profile, other patients change drastically down the esophagus. And that could be because of all the differences in bile acid reflux, the types of food you're eating, so it's also a kind of a potential high mutated sort of phenotype environment. So heterogeneity, it's a big one. It's a big one in precision medicine too, right? Because depending on what clones you've sequenced and the bit you're sequenced, that's going to tell you what treatment you're going to be using potentially. Um, so PCOG work, to what extent is tumor stage, type of tumor, primary versus MET versus lymph node controlled in a sample collection? 
So in PCOG, um, most of the samples are primaries. Um, even the melanomas, most of those samples are primaries as well. It's not the case for TCGA. Melanoma and TCGA is mainly lymph nodes and very few primaries. Um, it's a little bit, yeah, it's one, of the, it's one of the problems with melanoma. There are a few primaries around. Um, it's normally nodal samples that are sequenced and, and, um, and to what extent would stage in the site matter? I think I kind of answered that with Stevens as well. Um, the site does, does matter a little bit. Um, the tumors do change. There's more and more literature to show that in the primary context, you've probably got more subclones there. When you metastasize, you have um, less clones that exist. You've got clonal selection occurring. It definitely does occur. Um, and I think, did I get through all the questions? I think you're, you're amazing. You went through that so slickly. You hardly need anyone else on the line, Nick. Thanks so much. <laughs> oh, and, and I should say that last question was from Liz. So I do yes. want to say hi to Liz because she's just moved down to Melbourne from Brisbane. So yeah, she's a fantastic person. And, People should talk to her. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, thank you so much. That's, that was just brilliant and um, really nicely for such a broad and um, diverse program of work so, so well presented and such a, a great way to, to conduct the discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. You're welcome. So it's just um, for one final message about our next Precision Oncology Seminar, which is on the 27th of November. Um, we, very pleased to have Tony Purcell join. He's the head of um, the Purcell Lab at the Monash Biomedicine Discovery Institute. Um, the best way to stay in touch with um, subsequent announcements is, of course, to subscribe to our newsletter and also remain in contact via social media. So thank you very much for everyone for your attendance, especially Nick, um, and look forward to seeing you all at the next um, seminar. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.